Foodscape was setting up at that time as well. Um, and I think it was, for me, the, this relationship with knowing your farmers and um, knowing where your produce comes from, um, having that relationship with your environment and not seeing it as like a dead space. Um, it's something that I, I kind of took for granted growing up, you know, and, and I think in the last kind of the last two years, we are seeing sustainability, we're seeing these words of like food sovereignty, uh, food security, becoming part of mainstream conversation. You know, like it's something that everyone wants to talk about. And in, in terms of Singapore, it's still something that's a top-down approach, which is weird because I've seen grassroots movements addressing and working with these topics for 10, 20 years in Singapore, right? Like it's, it's, it's always been here. And there's people who've always been passionate about these topics, but maybe not using these terms in their conversation. And because they didn't use these terms, it was like, there was no value. It was something that was done as an outlier on the side, it's your passion. But now, these words are part of the global narrative on how we can move forward as a civilization, you know? And so that's why I think today's conversation, I mean, Vivian works a lot similarly in these topics. And I thought something that I really wanted to talk about was like, how can we bridge this gap between the people that have been working in these arenas, um, driven by their own passion, individually or as communities but are being kind of not part of the general conversation that's happening now around these topics you know like you could have been growing a community garden for the last 30 years you could have huge amount of foraging knowledge or knowledge of the plants that grow in your environment but because you're not using the right terms you're not writing about it or putting it out there, then you're not part of this huge push that's happening at the moment. And how can we bridge that? You know, like how can we make sure this knowledge that, and these people are not relegated to still being on the outside of this industry? Finally, when it's coming on trend, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's kind of what I would like to talk about today and kind of go a bit deeper into it as well. But I'm going to let Vivian share a little as well and see where this conversation goes. Yeah, thanks Nitya. I think definitely, I mean, Nitya and I had a, a conversation last week just to kind of think about how we want to um, bring forward some of these ideas and definitely, especially now, right, with uh, the pandemic and then people like, whether it's the government or whether it's people from the ground and people who didn't pay attention to what they're eating or where food comes from, like your regular Singaporeans who may not feel like they have a, a green finger or they feel like, you know, they're too busy in, in their banking world or whatever job that they're doing. that's not related to food. Um, starting to pay attention. So I think we're in a very exciting time. And definitely, I think one of the narrative of Singapore not having enough land, um, it's also something that um, we're shifting towards uh, the, uh, a new imagination of the fact that, hey, if you look around, there's actually a lot of underutilized um, spaces that we can do something with. And it's not just about, I mean, it is about growing food, but it is also about bringing people together. It is about, I think, um, heritage and culture. Right, I think that's also one of the aspects that you have brought up and also stuff that you have done in your work specifically, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe you want to share with us a little bit what you have done in that area with um, whether it's as a TV host with Edible Wow or yeah. So I mean this, like I mean I, I this show that I did um, with CNA, Edible Wild, which really was about kind of foraging and farming in the first season was about foraging and farming in Singapore and how we can convert these ingredients. Because a lot of the times we were like, okay, it's very good to farm. You have to grow all these native plants, but then how do you cook it? 
you know, and that's an important part of it. If you're not consuming what you cook and if you don't connect that dot, then it, it becomes irrelevant. Like, it doesn't matter how much native plants you're growing, you can feel good about it, but it's not having a full circle effect. Um, so that's kind of what we're trying to do over there. Um, it was very much, the whole series was very much an extension of work that I've been doing for the last 10, 15 years. Um, so it, I kind of studied anthropology and then I did archeology, span um, but it was while I was studying. So I left Singapore when I was 18 to go and study. And it was while I was studying that I started doing these pop-up supper clubs. You know, in, you know, I was in London, it was very multi like multicultural and dynamic. Um, I was secretary of my Afro-Caribbean society, don't ask me, you know, there wasn't a Singapore society. So, you know, they were like, you look Afro-Caribbean, you, you come in here, you know. So I learned how to cook like all these uh, food from the Caribbean and certain parts of Africa. But also that's where I started connecting the dots, like things that I had seen growing up in Singapore were integral parts of Caribbean cuisine, you know, as well as um, subtropical um, Africa, right? As well as South America, you know, like I, I always say this, the salt is coriander, for example, you know, that we see as kind of this weed um, here. And if you go to Teka Market or to Chinatown and you try to buy the salt is coriander, they, they call it the, like, they're like, oh, the Vietnamese like to use this. You know, but no one in Singapore buys it. What are you using it for? Whereas if you go to South America or Trinidad in the Caribbean, it's called Colantro um, and or Chadon Benny in Trinidad. And it's used in everything, you know, to cook with chicken, to make hot sauce. So it was all of these things. And I think that really kickstarted it. And because I was nostalgic for home, I started to cook the food that I missed and I was sharing it as well. So coming out of it, I worked in development economics. I worked in uh, contemporary art for a long time, but I always did these uh, supper clubs on the side. You know, I, 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 I worked at farmer's markets in London, at Borough Market. Uh, you know, I worked on an allotment at Battersea Gardens. So I was in London for seven years. So this was like a very kind of core part. And somehow I was trying to connect this access to urban farming that was so widespread, like in, in the UK, you know, this understanding of you could get an organic farm vegetable box delivered to you to your house weekly. Uh, and this was living in a major city and it was comparable to buying those same vegetables in the supermarkets. And for me, that became something that was normal, you know, and, and then I was trying to connect it to my childhood growing up in Singapore, uh, where my grandfather and my grandmother, so my grandfather was an avid gardener, so we, and also had a huge knowledge of native plants, um, you know, because he'd come from India when he was 13 or something. So a lot of the tropical plants overlapped, you know, he would be able to spot a moringa tree, a chiku tree, a soursop, you know, jackfruit. He knew, and, when, and he also knew like when it was going to come into season to get ready for the fruit. So sometimes he would just go for a walk in the morning and on the way back, you know, bring home a whole jackfruit, you know, and because my grandmother loved the banana flower. So he would bring like, you know, I'd be like, you know, people buy bananas from the shelves so and my grandfather would bring back the whole thing, you know, like a bunch of bananas with a flower at the end. And so my grandma would cook the flower and then we would eat the ripe fruit and the green bananas get cooked as well. So this was an experience that I had growing up, you know, almost 40 years ago now. But this, this, this was my version of Singapore, right? This idyllic version where all these things were available, lots of green spaces, uh, lots of wildlife growing up, you know? Like, uh, this is an anecdote that I kind of share where I, I came home, I was primary four, and I was gonna go into the washroom um, and there was a rice sack in there and it was wriggling about, right? My grandfather is like, oh yeah, you know, somebody caught a bonitor lizard uh, along Ulu Pandan. And, uh, you know, this is, we're gonna try and cook it for dinner today, for example. And I was just like, what? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, what? <laughs> How is this happening right now, right? And then it became this evening activity where this bonitor lizard gets 
skinned and and then cooked and you know if you ask me what it tastes like i'll tell you it tastes like a kind of slightly less fishier version of alligator but uh kind of like a prawn meets a chicken you know like that's kind of what it tastes like yeah it's just you know just made, made into a curry and then he would take the bile sack and break that into a glass of whiskey and shoot it down because that was a very old school thing to do just like they do with cobra blood in in thailand so i mean i'm not saying these are ethical um, nowadays, please do not go and hunt monitor lizards. I, I don't encourage it. Uh, I know there are a lot of them now, you know, hanging out in botanic gardens and all that. And so please don't say Nitya told me this is like a great thing to eat. So I'm just gonna go and do that. Um, it was a long time ago. And at that time, these were still things that you could do. You know, if you walk past a fruit tree in Singapore, you would see a bamboo stick with a little hook hidden behind the tree because it was a community effort, like for the mango trees, like, oh, okay, the mango trees are coming to, you know, fruit, so everybody can go and harvest. Uh, this was before Stomp, this was before the internet, so you're not gonna see your picture on anything, you're not gonna get caught, you know, and they did that. And you share the produce as well, you know, like I remember there used to be these rambutan trees all along Queenstown, like huge, you would just get, like people would just leave huge bags of them that you could then share you know, with the community and stuff. So I think that's kind of how it is. Like it was a very organic, natural way of absorbing information. And also what I thought was, and so I think what I've done since then is to try and recreate that memory. You know, like as my grandparents have passed away and stuff, um, when I first started doing brunch bandits on like a commercial scale, the social dining clubs, it was really to recreate these dinners that my grandmother used to have. You know, it was always open house. Weekends were open house. People would come all day to come and eat. Um, and I think as we, as we increasingly became single unit families or kind of smaller and smaller families, you know, um, I missed like this, like having 50 people and cooking a huge feast. Um, and I don't know how they did it, right? Like when I did it, I was just exhausted. Like each brunch bandit sessions just kind of like exhausted me. Uh, but I loved doing it. That's a high. So we did like Ethiopian meals. We did, as I said, in the West Indian, we did Kenya. We did foods that were inspired by meals in novels, you know, from, uh, from the clam chowder in Moby Dick to the biryani in I think those Midnight's Children, you know, to Prowse uh, Magdalene's, for example. Uh, and we did that in the projector. So there was always this, but the ingredients we used were always the first wave of where we would source ingredients were from local farms. And I think sometimes even from Foodscape Collective, because I remember there were times when um, I'd be like, I would message, Ying or Choi Fen, and I'd be like, look, you know, I need these ingredients and I can't find them in the market. And they'd be like, yeah, we know some like home gardeners that are growing it in Katong or something, you know? And then they would bring that to, for me on the day of the event and we would use them. So it was a huge community project and it was a way of kind of exploring culture, exploring how we are all interconnected, like they were more similar than we are different culturally, even with these places that we think are so exotic and so far away. Um, like we wouldn't have chilies in Southeast Asia if not for South America. You know, it was straight from South America that brought chilies to Southeast Asia. And so a lot of our cuisine is already very exotic if you think about it, because it's influenced. Every time you have a samba, you're, you know, you're like, it's like you're in Brazil or something. You know what I mean? Kind of. So I think I was trying to show that, and I was also trying to show that we had these great local producers. So we worked a lot with Evelyn from Green Circle Eco Farm. Um, like, so we did a, we did a brunch at uh, Sophie Chow Sentosa a couple of, a few years ago, which was about Asian superfoods, you know? So we got like her white brinjal, we got elephant grass from Green Circle. We juiced it down to make like uh, green shots instead of wheatgrass, elephant grass grows around here. So we made that and it grows around here wild. Like you can find it everywhere, you know? So it was, and it was these partnerships using quail from Uncle William's farm, 
uh, to make, uh, you know, like how in Jamaica they make jerk chicken. So we made a jerk quail, for, you know. Uh, so it's, and they, that's how the show came about. You know, it was just, like, I would never have done a TV show about something that I didn't care about. Like, I could have just gone, I could have joined CNA like 15 years ago and been a, you know, news reporter or something. But it had to be something that I cared about. And I, and I think because I was working with all these farmers, I was working with grassroots organizations, community organizations. Um, and they're like such great kind of like farmers on like doing projects on rooftops, like who are engaged. Like, I think there is, I don't know if Chun is on this um, call. I think he is, you know, there's him, you know, with his rooftop farm there is you know those edible garden city that i worked so closely with and you know working with beyond and the team like all these guys were like just going at it you know like it wasn't so much about the recognition it was they were doing it they were just walking the talk and they've been doing it for 10 years or maybe six years i don't know but it feels like a very long time <laughs> um and having those people to work with kind of really, I think, made me believe in what was possible in Singapore. And also, I think I was just like, you know, I felt like this, all of it was kind of on the outside of what we considered middle Singapore, you know? Like, I was like, how is this not part of our mainstream conversation? Uh, and how does it always feel like we're always talking to other people just like us? You know, it's, it was a very close, generous, collaborative network. But it also feels like we're usually just talking, you know, to ourselves. And it's like, how can we get that information out there? So, I mean, I, I did a little bit with my brunch sessions because we access a very, because it's the events side of things. So you, you do access kind of a more, uh, maybe people who are a little bit less focused on the gardening or the growing aspect, uh, a little more on the entertainment aspect. Uh, but it's suddenly like it's in the food, you know, like the messaging is there. Um, and I think that's what the TV show was as well. So we're going to do a few more projects this year um, around these themes. So you, you can await that on CNA. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thank you. That's really exciting. Yeah. Wonderful stories too. And actually, uh, I jotted two of my memory. So monitor lizard. So my mom's family used to live in uh, Pula Blakan Mati. Mm. So apparently my mom was a very good uh, monitor lizard catcher Ooh. <laughs> and she's small, you know, so I don't know how she did it. Maybe because she's small, she's able to move, um, you know, very, very uh, quickly and easily if they go under the trees or something, you know. Oh, that's amazing. But I, yeah, that's, that's the only thing I heard, but I don't know if they actually do the whole skinning and whatever they do with it. They I, must. I'm, I'm sure she just doesn't catch it for entertainment, right? <laughs> I don't know. I should find out. Um, but the other memory is uh, actually with Trey Fern at an MRT station when I was passing her some herbs. I don't know. I can't remember whether it's basil or something, but there was an event and there was exactly a call to the, the collective um, about like, you know, oh, we need some of these herbs, uh, and then, you know, like, I think it was like Thai basil or something like this. Yeah. It's very and possible, yeah. how we were doing it. Like, I couldn't attend, so I was just like, I have a bunch of them, so I just meet her at the MRT, and I didn't even exit, you know, I just like pass it to her, and that's, that's how it happened. Um, yeah. I thought that some of the points that I felt um, into to, to go into is also how like you said like how is it that all this um uh, really multifaceted uh, um attitudes towards food right but now like you know food as culture as social as community whether you're sharing the 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 um mangoes from the tree that is just out there and you just pick it and then you know you have a bag and you just share and there is not so much a sense of proprietorship Right? Mm. It's like, it's, it's out there, it's public, you know, anyone who's hungry, who enjoys mango can have it um, to, and we're not that old, right? <laughs> and, but, you know, That's subjective, like, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, um, uh, until like now, the conversation around food is very much dominated by, uh, you know, this 
like, as you said, food security and uh, productivity. And, um, and actually, if I'm not wrong, you're not supposed to, even if you encounter fruit trees, you're not supposed to uh, take them, right? It's, it's illegal. Correct me yes. if I'm wrong. But yeah. well, let's, let's be very clear about this. Foraging <laughs> in Singapore is illegal, guys. <laughs> so. Right. So, so I feel that, like, yeah, how is it that we have evolved or devolved, whatever it is, um, into this state? Uh, in our relationship with food and therefore in our relationship with nature, food that is mm. produced from nature, right? Um, as opposed to a lot of the conversation now, which is about productivity and uh, high tech. Um, and it's really just to feed us as if fuel for the machine. But what mm. happens to the culture and the social and the um, health, you know, connection and community aspect of things. And, and um, I thought, Something that you you have in your in your scope as well uh, as an anthropologist um, heritage the concept mm. of heritage like how what are we inheriting and how are we going forward and what can we choose what we want to inherit and how do we do that is there some aspect of your work maybe with audacity or, or somewhere you with these questions. And how, like, I think, um, hmm. maybe I'll just uh, complete my thought here. It's also that, you know, when you talk about Green Circle Eco Farm and the type of food that we eat. So the type of food that we eat, um, we have become cultivated to eat those certain type of food that is very limited. Um, that is, a lot of it is not uh, native, not locally grown. But if you were to order, let's say, a veggie basket from uh, a, a Green Circle Eco Farm, there will be a lot of them. Uh, many people don't know how to work with them. And yeah, so I'm just wondering, like, how can we breach that? And how can we support that? And also, uh, what, what would that mean for us in, in our health, in our culture, changing our, changing our taste bud as well? Yeah. I mean, I think something that, like, I, I think, you know, I compare, we think we have a lot of choice in Singapore. You know, we are a very urbanized, wealthy, uh, tiny city. You know, we, our history is based on trade, right? And now with all this excess that we have, there is no need to eat seasonal. You know, we, we can eat whatever we want, whatever we want if we can afford it and it's convenient. And the thing with our supermarkets is we think when we go there, oh, you know, we have so much choice, you know, but what's happening is that the supermarkets are defining those choices for us, right? Like that's, that's a very important thing that we have to take note. And something that I always kind of boggle my mind is we have a huge migrant population, right? Um, like there's, you know, we have a lot of people coming in from our neighboring countries and this, the last few waves of migration that we have, a lot of new citizens are from the region. And I think, how is it that our supermarkets don't reflect this? You know, um, how come we don't have produce that's used actively in the cuisines of this, these regions, which would also support the native plants that we have in Singapore as well, because the overlap is, there's a lot of overlap, you know, you go to a Thai supermarket, you go to a supermarket in the Philippines, you go to a supermarket in uh, KL, you know, uh, there are so many local plants that are stocked in the supermarkets. You know, you get your fancy baby vegetables from Cameron Highlands. You have all your edible flowers that you can just go and get. You know, you don't have to order it online or anything. You know, you, you go to a Thai supermarket, you have your Tonkin jasmine. You have your other two other flowers that they use. Um, I can't remember the names right now. But I use in their daily stir fries with, om you know, with eggs as part of an omelette. And it's so accessible. It's there. And I think, okay, you know, the, it's not a question of age or the younger generations just don't know how the older generation used to eat. It's the fact that these things are available 
in the places that the, the younger generation is going to buy. Maybe they don't want to go to a wet market and bargain and not, sh not know what the price is. But in an environment that they're familiar with, these native ingredients are still available for them to use. What I'll be curious about, and if you have a huge expat population in your cities like KL or Bangkok, they are curious about it as well. They're like, oh, this looks interesting. Oh, I want to kind of try this and cook this at home. I might not cook it the traditional way, but I will use it, you know? And, and I think we are dropping the ball with that. Um, and when, when a supermarket now in Singapore says, we're going to stock more local ingredients, what they mean is locally grown kale or lettuce from an indoor farm. You know, and nothing against that. I think, you know, Sustainer, Comcrop, they do great work. Um, and they're really trying to support with us reaching our food security goals. And if you think about it, you know, lettuce comes from Egypt, so maybe it's not that far away anyway. Uh, but the fact that I can't go to NTUC and find Moringa leaves or um, find kind of like agati leaves or even laksa leaves, you know, like, I'm like, huh? Why, why does this not exist? Xingxiong, maybe a little bit better, carries a lot more kind of local herbs, it carries vegetables from Chenfa. And, and so I think that's a very big thing. Uh, we can't ignore the fact that uh, we have become creatures of convenience in, in big cities. Um, so the access, the major players do have to make a difference and they do have to make this available. I think it'd be nice for supermarkets here to have a small section that says vegetables from the com community. Maybe it was grown within 10 kilometers of this particular supermarket. So it's just there. Maybe that's something that we can encourage. So it doesn't have to be perfect looking produce. It doesn't have to hit the quantities that commercial supermarkets expect for you to be a supplier. But it can be a fun little kind of corner. It's almost like a learning corner, you know, right? Like, and that encourages, like right next to where I stay, like just outside my window, I look at this empty patch of grass, you know, that's about probably about 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers. I don't know, my sense of measurements are a bit bad, so don't believe me, uh, maybe it's fine. But um, it's empty, you know, and it's SLA um, grass and they come and they cut it like all every week and it's just there. And I'm like, this could be something, right? This could be a community plot, this could be a, fruit tree forest, which requires very little maintenance. And the produce can then be um, kind of sold just to cover the cost of maintaining it or something. So I think these systems, are, these are what I think of as part of the food security conversation, which also ensures food sovereignty, which also ensures that native plants are present, they're seen, they're available. Maybe they're just going to lie on the shelves for the next three months because nobody knows what to do with it. But I'm pretty sure if we persist in six months to a year, people would be trying it out, you know, like because people are interested. They're just like, I don't want to go all the way to take a market to buy Moringa leaves, you know, but I would like, I'm okay to walk 10 minutes to my supermarket to try it out if it's there. So I think these are the ways we need to change that conversation. And I think in terms of heritage, um, I'm not a traditionalist, right? I, I don't think we need to cling on to how things have been done for the last hundred years. I think there's a lot to learn from our past. And, and a lot, I mean, I, was, I think I, was, I don't know who I, was, I, was, I might have been talking to you about this, Vivian, but like so much of what we think of as like sustainable living now, you know, less plastic, uh, use bamboo toothbrushes, use loofah sponges, you know, these are things our grandparents did when they were children. Like this sustainability is an Asian driven thing, you know, and what we know of as superfoods, is also an Asian driven thing. It's just that we've had to wait for the West to brand it, put a label on it, put some value on it and publish it in like, I don't know, Elle magazine or something before we're like, oh my God, I want some of that. Um, so I think that's kind of what I want us to change, to, to change the way we talk about heritage, um, see the value in it, but also evolve, like everything we do has to make sense where we are right now. 
Like, it doesn't make sense for me to spend 10 hours making a chili rimpa paste using a mortar and pestle. You know what I mean? Like, it's great. If I have the time, I enjoy doing that. But is that going to prevent me from making it because I see it as too large a time investment? Then just use your normal machine and just make it. Um, adapt the ingredients. You know, you don't have 15 of those ingredients. Use what you have. Adapt, adjust, make it present but don't stop doing it because you think it has to follow tradition. Um, I think that for me is the most important thing um, for us to create value, find value, add value, and also believe in the worth of what we have around us and our heritage and not be afraid to tear it apart and adapt it for where we are now. So that's how I see it. For sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess I just have one, one little comment, which is uh, interesting what you just said, because uh, I was talking to somebody else about uh, also the, the foodscape and all this conversation about food security and productivity and how actually what we are trying to do is to um, provide food that is uh, um, nourishing, not just for the individual but also um, potentially the climate we're in right so it's a bit about environment and when we say nourishing we're also talking about the physical but social community aspect. and then um, uh, there seems to be attack and then there's also and generative. I think what you have pointed out is, is exactly what I'm also trying to extend. It's not a one, it's not the method itself per se, but you know, what is value adding and what actually can work towards the goal that we want to have. So I feel that the conversation in, uh, now with high tech is like, it's more focused on tech rather than the food and the value of it. Yeah. And, and how do we um, make use of appropriate technology in, uh, in a way that consider, um, uh, yeah, consider holistic, um, holistic approach to life? What is life giving? Mm -hmm. So as you say, you know, you don't, you don't spend like 10 hours pounding on the mortar and pasta. I, I do sometimes. I but... <laughs> yeah, I do that sometimes too. No, the fact is that if I have a grinder, I'm going to use a grinder sometimes, right? So it's not about not using technology, but it's how do we find that balance? I think that, that is the key. And sometimes we kind of get stuck on, you know, whether it's the, 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 the tools itself and we forget what is the, actually what we're trying to get at. Yeah. So I wonder if um, any, I mean, AJ and I can talk for ages and, and, um, I guess she has something to respond to. I also want to leave some time for the floor in case anybody have any question, you can also type into the chat, I guess. Yeah. Mm. So uh, you were cutting off at some point. So do excuse if I, if I miss anything, but I think <laughs> I got the gist of what you're saying. Um, and I think that's kind of what for me is one important aspect of sustainability as well. Like if you are, if we are focused so much on the tech side as being the solution for sustainability and the future of food, right? But we negate the sustainability of culture, you know, the, the element of culture sustainability. How do we feed our heritage? You know, how do we feed ourselves? Like, I don't think it's fair to say everybody go out right now and stop eating cheese, stop eating all these imported food products and let's just all live on kind of sweet potato leaves and tapioca. You know, I think that's quite unfair. But I think it's about kind of incorporating those things into your diet slowly, 10%, 20%, 30%. And if we create a demand for it, I think it would also create a space where there's value added to growing these native plant crops. And the one thing that really scares me about where we are going with our approach to the future of food or farming 
is that it's moving further and further away from soil-based farming. Um, so I think the fact that things are becoming indoors, I remember talking to hay dairies and, you know, he was saying, we're going to build a condo for the goats. Like it's not going to be one level anymore. It's going to be four levels of goats because it's a more efficient use of space. So, I mean, I think in those things, you know, maybe sometimes it's worthwhile to navigate. But then with stuff like the fact that Green Circle might not exist anymore next year is worrying for me. Um, you know, can you grow the plants that Green Circle grows under LED lights indoors? Is that something that's possible? Um, is there a way to make soil-based farming more efficient? Is there a way for it to be something that is a sustainable career to have? You know, not something that looks nice, is a fun hobby, uh, you know, but something that actually yields enough. And I think it's possible. Like you look at tropical fruit trees, they yield more than you could ever use uh, during when they come into harvest. Uh, maybe for crops that take a lot of space, maybe there is a way to approach it. I think that's where technology should be leading. That's kind of what I'm trying to say. It shouldn't just be the brand new thing, but how about doing things a little bit better? And that's why I like the work that I'm doing with Audacity um, and Slice Robo Cafe, because there is the thing of like, okay, you know, tech is fun. It looks good. It's, 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 it, it makes indoor farming look very nice. Uh, it's clean, it's controlled. You get a determined you know, amount of yield but we are also aware that we're losing so much of our culture. Like every time we cut down or close down one of these soil based farms, a, a chunk, a priceless chunk of our culture disappears, you know? And, and then I don't think it should be, I don't think it should people, I don't think it should be sacrificed to continue it. If you understand what I'm saying. We need to find a way where soil-based urban farming is something that's profitable, that's sustainable, and yields good harvest that feeds the community. For sure. Yeah, I hear you. And, and I also feel that, for example, uh, Green Circle Eco Farm, it will be interesting to see how a space like this can evolve, right? Uh, not to completely get stuck in the way that it has been um, and, and, and yeah, grow with the times as well. But I think the core values, if it's something that we can identify as is valuable to us, then um, the tools are just tools to get us where we want to go, right? It's, mm -hmm. Instead of being stuck with the tools. Um, yeah. So we have a few questions from the floor. Uh, Liz asks, on the topic of urban foraging mentioned just now, do you see any value in the loosening of the strict laws around such practices in Singapore? Perhaps even involving more grassroots communities in the regulation of such practices in their respective areas? So I think a good example to give is, uh, with food waste in supermarkets, right? For a long time, uh, the reason food wasn't sold at reduced prices was for legal reasons and food safety reasons. Mm -hmm. And then you had communities like SG Food Rescue that were a grassroots community organization that navigated the in-between space of, okay, we're going to collect food that's kind of not stuff not suitable for sale and we're going to distribute it to these channels um, and we're going to have the space to do so. Um, so I think kind of foraging, the reason foraging is illegal in Singapore uh, is for similar reasons. It's, I, I believe, it's for legal protection and also for food safety. So if you eat something that you foraged and you fall sick and you forage from state land, you know, the state doesn't want you to sue them or, or complain to them about it. Um, another thing is also about kind of preserving the quality of the spaces. So if you don't know how to forage or you aggressively 
forage, then you also do have the tendency to destroy uh, natural spaces. So that's a risk as well, especially in Singapore because we parks are places for recreation, not for food. So because of that, uh, those are the two main reasons I think we have to speak to and parks to get a, a wider response. But that's what I feel might be the reason. So a grassroots organization or a licensed group that is both educational in terms of where you can forage, what you can forage, these are the mushrooms you can eat, these are the mushrooms that you shouldn't touch, these are wild cucumbers, you know, these are creeping cucumbers, when they're green they're okay, when they're dark green or black they're going to give you diarrhea. You know, so like to have that information passed down um, is important and I think also it's a hand-in-hand -hand practice. So if we have more community green spaces then maybe you don't harvest enough for you to go home and make your dinner, maybe you harvest enough for you to go and grow it in your community space instead. So you encourage, the, so it spreads, right? So you, for the creeping cucumber as an example, you don't harvest all of it. You take like 10 pods, you go back in your little community garden or the green space that's been activated next to your house, you plant it. And in two months, you have creeping cucumbers to eat all day. You know what I mean? So I think that is kind of where we can go with foraging uh, in Singapore. Yes, because I think we still want our parks to be display spaces and we don't want anyone to uh, forage uh, without the knowledge of what can be eaten and not eaten. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And um, another point that I, 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 another thought that I had early on is also how um, when we talk about sustainability, we also have to take care of the environment. We have to take care of the ecology um, around it, right? So, so it's not just about um, taking what we want, but it's also in the process of that taking care of um, what is producing for us, right? So I think like if you just uh, recklessly or over harvest something, um, then that's when it becomes not sustainable, right? So um, yeah, the next question we have, are there channels that we can engage the authorities on making publicly accessible edible forest gardens, like a small urban space to grow a forest that the public can forage in. Hmm. Yes. Oh, so I mean, I kind of answered that, I, I, I know, but I'm also saying if you find an empty green space near your house, uh, right in to SLA, they, they are quite open. Um, I think what they're most worried about is that it will be mismanaged or kind of, you know, you plant something for a month while you're very excited about it. And then two months later, you know, rats are running through. Um, but if you're committed to it, um, I think they're very open to have a discussion. And the more people that write to them about these spaces, engage your community, right? Like, so imagine, oh yeah, yeah SLA definitely, yes, they are the people to do so. So go disturb them, right? Uh, they, they, are, they want to innovate these spaces. A good thing to do, imagine there's this green square, right? Most, most places tend to be squares for some reason in Singapore, very clearly boarded out and fenced. Uh, if you live near that, kind of get like, if you can get like signatures from like um, the people around that space to kind of say like, we are all very interested in using this as a space to grow stuff. Um, yeah, just kind of open up that discussion. Yes, thanks Vivian, you're absolutely right. So go to that, you can register that space. Um, but also kind of think about like how much time you're willing to invest because the NPARC's community in Bloom, um, Choi Fan, please correct me if I'm wrong, I remember when they opened up some of the spaces, they require a certain amount of time commitment and uh, also how present you are there during the week as well. For the Sunset Way ones, for sure, the ones at Ulu Pandan, definitely they require you to be there so you don't have mosquitoes, you're not breeding mosquitoes, there's no stagnant water, you're regularly present. And I was like, the only people who can meet this criteria are retired retirees and housewives because like you're blocking out a huge chunk 
um, of people who might be interested because they don't fit this profile. So I think it's changing, um, you know, the, the center for future cities, um, HDB, they're all very activated in terms of converting rooftop spaces and public spaces into urban forests. So you're right on trend. Uh, you're right on time as well. So just write to them and then see where it goes. Yeah, I'll reach out to Fullscape. Sorry, I just threw you under the <laughs> Reach out to Fullscape. Um, ask Choi Fen. If they say no, say Choi Fen. What can I do to make them say yes? yes. <laughs> Um, that America, Mor I guess Moringa. Moringa is from India. Oh dear. I don't know if you can still hear me. Yes, yes. Okay, our cuisine and our idea of native plants are constantly changing. Could you elaborate on the value of growing native plants and soil based farming? What is the value of culture and heritage? I, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, I think Han is absolutely right, right? Like, what we know of in Singapore because of trade and culture and soft colonization, hardcore colonization, we've had all of, we've experienced all of those things. Uh, we had kind of soft cultural colonization from India, from the second BC onwards. That's how you got your Mahapahit Empire, your Sri Vijaya Empire all over Indonesia, uh, your Angkor Wat in Cambodia. So that's what India was doing. So you see a lot of plants that work in this subtropical region, uh, which overlap with Java, which overlap a lot with India, especially South and Eastern India. Uh, you see a lot of overlap. So, I mean, it's how far are you going to trace back? You know, um, I think if you find it grows well here, uh, you know, to your geography, to it's in the soil, with the weather you have, you know, like you have done yourself, we are all native plants, right? Like, uh, we are, I consider myself a native plant. Um, but my heritage and roots are, are widespread and varied, um, you know. But I adapt to my environment. I, I, I am a product of all my influences and what I continue to go on and influence. So I think with the Moringa tree, your Rambutan tree, um, they're doing the same thing. You know, so if they survive here, they do well here, they're part of your cuisine. And also the things that are going to become a part of your cuisine. You know, you, I mean, we can talk about mani chai, we can talk about all the different kinds of gingers we have here, the different turmerics we have here, arrowroot, you know, there's, there's such a huge variety. But you also look at things which are so popular now. You look at um, Mexican tarragon, for example, you know, which does really well here. So I wouldn't say it's a native plant. But in 30 years from now, it might be. Yeah. Uh, right? And, and things like Roselle, which grows all over. It grows in Africa. It's called folklore to Jamaica in the Caribbean, in, in South America. And in India, we have it as well, right? But in India, nobody uses the fruits. Everyone uses the leaves. Mm. They don't know you can use the fruits. And everywhere else, they don't use the leaves. They use the fruits to make jams and teas and, you know. So I think culture and heritage is constantly evolving and it should constantly evolve as should our idea of what native plants are. Yeah. I feel like there's also two um, parts to this or, or rather the perspective that I look at, you talk about native and soy based farming and uh, there's the aspect of culture, right? Culture as something that is uh, created by us human beings. Um, and then there's also the aspect of nature. You spoke about uh, growing seasonal or, or, I mean, eating seasonal or like plants that would grow here. So, mm -hmm. of course, with, um, you know, the, the state of the world, uh, that we are in today where there's a lot of trading, as you mentioned. So, it's, natural that we will bring in plants from different parts of the world but I think the key is also like there's the culture aspect but there's also the nature aspect if we are able to grow these plants here uh, with not too much effort I would say like they actually can adapt to the natural environment here then why not right as opposed to like 
trying to grow food that is uh, only able to grow in a uh, um, temperate climate um, and then trying to force it to grow here. And because we are so, we want to eat those food for whatever reason, then we start to create uh, fancy stuff around trying to grow them artificially. So, so yeah, so I think it's also like the natural aspects of things um, and how through food we are actually connecting back to the health of uh, the environment, the ecology. Yeah, I mean, I would say this, this, I mean, there's a huge, the thing with native plants, I think, probably the, is the, the issue with native plants at the moment is that they're not very sexy, right? Like if you type in kale, there's probably like 2 million recipes on how you can use kale different variations on how to make kale chips and kale salad. Like there will be, you know, two, two million versions of it. But if you type in Moringa, it's probably going to be like 10 ways to make a smoothie or like to make a stir fry. Like, you know, the variations um, don't exist. And I think eating is also a community thing. Like we want to kind of partake in a lifestyle when we eat. So if, if like no one else, is eating those things or you don't feel you're part of a community that's eating those things it's a very lonely experience you know you're like oh here i am eating my sad dish of turkey berries and uh you know like nobody else understands me so i think it's about kind of uh creating more of a community around it uh right putting out recipes about it um and not necessarily using them in a traditional way you know, like I make a moringa quiche, for example. Uh, it's very easy to eat. I, you know, like it, it's, it's, you wouldn't even know. It, you know it's moringa, but it's very fun to eat, right? It's like making a kale quiche, for example. Or sweet potato leaves, how can we use them? Um, and growing up, we used to eat jackfruit seeds as well. But nowadays, very rarely it's used. Um, the different kinds of, I think gingers as well that we have here, go to cola. Just, I mean, I'm just throwing out random names, I know, but I think it's like, there's so much, uh, but there's not enough accessible content on using them. Uh, and I think also, I think we need to make them look more appealing. Uh, it's, it's like, if, I, if you buy broccoli or kale from the supermarket, probably takes you 10 minutes to prep and make it into a dish, you know? Uh, you buy sweet potato leaves, very fast to cook, kind of not very complicated. But everything else, you know, like, how are you going to use this? What am I going to do? Uh, what does this mean? Right? You know it's nutritious, but how do I cook it? And some of them are very bitter. A lot of the native plants can be quite bitter. The leaves, they're, they're hardier than usual. They're, they're more chewy. Um, I get Egyptian spinach from, uh, from Firefly's Health Farm. It's called Molokia. It's like an ancient green, it's super good for you. But it's, a kind of, it's, it's kind of sticky. It's got a mucusy kind of uh, texture to it, you know? So it's, I think we have to be curious. We have to be open. Maybe create a support group, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, a, like a book club. <laughs> plant, plant of the week. That everybody cooks their different variations of it and then shares recipes. And yeah, I think that might be a nice thing yeah. to do moving forward as well. Yeah, and definitely like working with hawkers, um, as Manway said, you know, to include them in. Like, I remember last time when you used to buy bamian, there was always mani chai in it, right? It would sprinkle a, a bit at the top. Um, so that's one dish. Different variations of lecha, I think, as well. Um, yeah, and green bean soup, which uses that stinky herb, you know, which no one uses anymore. Uh, I think it's Rue, Rue, the Rue family, herbs of grace or something which grows wild around here as well. So yeah, let's do that. Let's create a support group. And, uh, you know, I eat native plants dot com. I don't know. <laughs> so you, you, can, you can start that and we can join you. Um, I sure. just thought that I will share two, two little points because in our previous conversation, when we come to this point, we also mentioned how like, if you search on Google and uh, I imagine that all of us here are English speakers. And if you don't, like if you search in English, then mm. you would 
uh, um, information from in English, right? That's only available in English for the most part. Yeah. And if it's in a, a, a another language, like for example, uh, Tamil or uh, Mandarin, if some of some of um, us can can do that, but then your first um, language that you use is actually English. So, like I also um, work in Thailand, and I know that there's a lot of stuff there that's available, but my Thai is definitely not Google searchable in Thai, right, you know. So, so, so that also means that I can only have access to a certain uh, type of information. Yeah. So I, I, I thought, and, and the other thought that I have is also like when you mentioned about, you know, being curious and trying out different things. I really appreciate um, William's question. Um, which is about, you know, how can we use that in the hawkers so that, you know, even it's like not everyone wants to grow and not everyone wants to experiment with uh, ingredients or be a cook, right? But then they can still be able to taste this um, in your common commonplace in Singapore. And I remember when I uh, am, one of the things that I really enjoy being in my farm in uh, Chiang Mai in the village is that I have abundance of, of this native naturally growing um, plants or fruits or vegetables. So I am not, uh, I can afford to experiment with them because I'm not like paying a lot, lot of money for them. And I have to experiment with them because otherwise, you know, they go to waste. So, so I feel like if we imagine that the, the roadside in Singapore, the underutilized spaces are actually full of all these, um, you know, ingredients, precious ingredients, then that also encourage us to build up that uh, capacity to, to experiment and to find new ways of engaging with them. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you want to share? I just noticed that it's seven o'clock. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think Foodscape does a great job connecting all these dots and we look forward to them connecting more dots. Uh, <laughs> You know, um, I think also at the moment, a lot of it is like, it's unpaid labor, right? So we, it's like, it's, it's like doing uh, things outside of your regular job or whatever your regular way of, you know, um, existing in Singapore is. So I think it's about creating projects. It's about kind of government bodies thinking a little bit differently about how they allocate funds. Um, I think doing pop-up stalls at hawker centers, um, partnering up with young local chefs to do renditions of local ingredients. Like right now, I see a lot of it in fine dining. Um, the incubator Magic Square had some excellent young local chefs uh, do interesting things with Belimbing, um, you know, Centella, Asiatica. They used all this interesting stuff. But the fact that it's relegated to the fine dining world, um, is still quite inaccessible accessible, and we want to make this mainstream like i want the uncles that used to eat it growing up to still be able to taste it now right um so i think yeah it'd be fun to do pop-up stalls and hawker centers to encourage supermarkets to have a small little corner for native plants like bring it mainstream i think and for that we have to grassroots organizations can campaign and they can make it happen but I think these should be funded projects initiated or pitched to large government bodies who are looking to explore what food security can look like, but perhaps not in a multi-dimensional way yet, but they can expand it. So that's all I've got to say. Thank you so much for joining me.